I am super excited for uh, today's guest for the Research and Tech Talks. Uh, I am Mark Lesser. I'm the Vice President for Research and Technology here at NAF. I am joining you from my home office in the great state of uh, New Jersey. Um, for those who have been waiting on YouTube, my apologies for the live broadcast, uh, technical difficulties such as uh, life in uh, a technological world. I really appreciate you hanging on. And for those who maybe can't stay for the whole talk, we are still gonna go about an hour. Um, there will be a recording of this broadcast. Um, you can also check the links uh, from this introduction here that I will have above me on YouTube to reach the whole playlist for Research and Tech Talks all year long. Uh, this one is a really exciting one. Um, I am gonna tell you a little bit about Kez before I bring him on uh, screen. So as uh, he is the managing director for KPMG Innovation Labs at KPMG US. Kez uh, Sampanthar is managing director for the Innovation Lab. It's a globally recognized, uh, he is globally recognized as a thought leader at the intersection of business, human experience, and tech. He is the head of research at KPMG, where he leads design thinking in initiatives for the firm and directs research into business model innovation and customer insights. His experience spans over two decades through the worlds of tech, design, and innovation. He is a sought after speaker on custom insights, innovation and disruption. Kez, um, welcome and thank you so much for doing this. Hi, Mark, it's great to see you. Yeah, I'm very excited for this talk and uh, you know, NAF is definitely one of the uh, organizations we love working with. So thank, thank you for inviting me on. We're really grateful to have you here. And as soon as uh, we started to talk about this talk that you have been giving to, um, you know, as, as part of onboarding for new employees and doing some exciting things, uh, mental models and compounding intelligence, right away, it felt like the kind of thing that our educators, some of these strategies uh, are things that our educators can use coming into either, whether you look at it as um, coming out of 2021 or 2020, 21 school year, and thinking about uh, all of um, the constraints and difficulties we had in this past year, and really thinking about how to plan into the coming year, uh, or you do it as uh, you take some of these strategies and use them as you kick off your summer and start thinking about planning for the new year. Um, right away, I think that the talk struck me as something I really wanted to bring um, to the folks in our network. So thank you for doing this. I'm going to step out of the way and, um, and share uh, some slides. Hi, Mark. Um, you know, as you were saying, mental models and compounding intelligence. You know, it's a, um, a talk I've been giving for uh, the last couple of years, you know, to uh, a lot of our new hires. And uh, it's uh, based on, you know, 30 years of my um, sort of experience trying to understand, you know, how to learn, how to learn better, um, especially in the innovation space, especially in our labs. Uh, we have to, you know, pick up information really quickly. We have to understand and deep dive into new industries and new topics. And so we're constantly looking for people who are comfortable learning. And this idea of being able to, um, you know, use your brain better, which is, we'll talk a lot more about it, but uh, is what sits behind this talk. So this idea of mental models and compounding intelligence and, um, you know, I apologize for the obligatory uh, Einstein picture, but it was a beautiful picture, which one of my uh, designers put together uh, as he listened to all the things I said. Um, the idea of being able to use this, these techniques as teachers, as educators, as students, uh, I think would be a great fit. So hopefully you'll enjoy, um, you know, um, how I explain this and some of the frameworks underneath it. And, uh, you know, let's move forward to the next slide. So one of the key things which, you know, when I talk to my team about, you know, how do people learn? And I always look at some of the greatest thinkers in history. 
you know, <laughs> you know, I'm always speaking to a young audience. So, you know, try and pick up on some of the terminology. My kids uh, always talk about GOAT, the greatest of all time. As you look at this sort of, uh, these set of images of some of the greatest thinkers through history and recent history anyway, um, you know, who do you think is the greatest thinker? You know, we've got um, Bill Gates, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ada Lovelace, uh, Richard Feynman. You know, obviously Einstein's there, Claude Shannon. Uh, you've got a number of different people who you might be familiar with and some who you aren't. But the idea of being able to use your brains to be able to learn, create, think better. You know, I always think about this idea of great thinkers. And what I'm going to do as I break this down is kind of show that there isn't a one-size-fits-all for the types of thinking which we sort of want to achieve. And I'll explain a little bit more about it. But this idea of, you know, who is the greatest thinker, you know, to me, it might be a little bit of a misnomer. So we go to the next slide. This idea of the brain user manual has been something which um, I've been focused on for a long time. I, I joke, and um, you know, my designer created this sort of uh, you know brain user manual for dummies kind of image. But you know, what would you look up if you had a brain user manual? What are the types of questions you would look up? Because to me. As soon as I started programming, and I started programming pretty young, I, you know, it's like I was about nine years old, and I started using one of the early microcomputers, and um, I had a manual, and I was learning to program it and be able to do things with it. And um, my first question as I was starting to learn this, A, I was learning so much information, but this idea was, um, how do I... Uh, do the things with my brain. So the idea of the computer as an analogy for my brain, I was like, where's the user manual for my brain? I always joke with my teams, you know, when did you get the user manual for your brain? Did you get it when you were at school? Did you get it as a graduation present? Like, the answer is, like, none of us have really had a brain user manual. But I think all of us would like to have it, like, to look up how to use it better. You know, how do I improve my memory? How do I extend it? How do I, you know, make, you know, think faster? What software do I need? So these are the types of questions which were have been running through, you know, my brain for 40 plus years. And, um, you know, what led me to do a lot of research. So, you know, I'm an AI researcher um, uh, and doing things like neural networks or what is called deep learning now. I did that like uh, 30 plus years ago. And then I went into, you know, I left academia and came into the business world uh, as during an AI winter. And um, what I was constantly having to do was learn new subjects, learn it deeper. But I always had this idea of like, how do computers do what they do? How can we use our brain as a computer better? And how do we do that better? So that's what led me down this path to actually be able to do this. If I think about the brain, it is a, you know, I always think it's, it, there's input, there's process, and there's output. It's as simple as that as a mechanism. And being able to use this framework, we can sort of think through this idea of, you know, how do we learn better techniques for inputting information, for processing information, and potentially outputting information. These are all things which I'm going to unpack as I think about this sort of question. Is like, what is intelligence? What is this ability for us to think? If we go to the next slide. So I'm going to go through a number of stories. And these stories are you know, uh, interesting in themselves, but they're actually the breadcrumbs through my research, which allowed me to get to this point where when I brought these things together and I realized that it actually gave us a better insight into how our brains actually work. So I'm going to start with the first story, which is AlphaGo. I'm not sure you're familiar with it, but uh, AlphaGo um, is done by a company called DeepMind, who is now owned by Google. And you know, back in um, uh, a few years ago, they made news because they'd created a you know a deep learning network which could beat the champion of go 
And, and Go is one of those really complex games. So if you think about chess, most people are familiar with chess. Go is an order of magnitude more complex to the point, you know, the people who play it and in the countries which take it really seriously, you know, they start training for this at a really young age. You know, by the age of like four or five, they're already going to specialized schools for this. It takes many years to master to the point they have a, a similar system to karate and taekwondo in the belt system. So the idea of being a really top master is not only a black belt, but um, to go up in the, the levels of Dan. So Lisa Doll is a ninth Dan at Go. He's actually the top player you know, in history at Go, which is one of the most complex games and obviously has been you know, played by many people. So the idea of a computer being able to beat him was big news. And uh, it's funny because my research back 30 years ago was building neural networks, which are really deep learning before it was called deep learning, but with very uh, sort of uh, similar algorithms, but we didn't have the computers at the right processing speed, nor did we have the enough data, and we couldn't do half of what we had. So to the point when I was teaching it to play chess, which is very different than expert systems. I was actually teaching it to play chess the same way we would learn chess as, you know, as kids. You know, I had to teach it moves and I had to teach it like, you know, what tactics were, what a fork is and what a skewer is. And I was trying to build it up and I had to train these networks over and over again. And, you know, it would take weeks, months sometimes to actually get a network to be able to perform. The idea of being able to do this to play Go was so far out of my, uh, my imagination at the time. And um, you know, after the AI winter, the funding dried up. I, you know, I left academia. Um, I didn't think about this again until I started hearing the stories. You know, self-driving cars. We started talking about. You know, AI had moved forward. Deep learning had come on. But when I saw, you know, AlphaGo beat this Go champion in this series of games, I realized something had changed. You know, not only do we have more data, we have more processing power. The algorithms are refined, and it was such a big you know, wake up call to how far AI had come and where where could we be taking it. But this story gave me a little clue because what it allowed me to think about was the same way a computer can be trained to play chess, I realized the same model, this idea of AI could be used to actually think about thinking itself. And I'll come back and explain that more. We go to the next slide. So the next story is actually about a fighter pilot. Yeah, it was actually a conversation I was having with a, a colleague of mine. Um, his father had been in the Israeli Air Force and had been a fighter pilot. And it, my friend was talking to me about you know brains and obviously it's something which I'm very interested in. I've done a lot of research in, and he was asking, "It's like so." You know, what is it about my father? Like, what makes him so good at being a fighter pilot? How does he think so fast? You know, how does he make the, that, the reaction speeds to be able to be in a dogfight uh, as a fighter pilot? Like, are fighter pilots smarter than everybody else? You know, as a son looking up to his father, you know, he had a lot of respect and, you know, was, uh, was you know, always thought of his father as a really smart guy. And he thought fighter, being a fighter pilot was this epitome of this idea of being smart. So the question to me was like, is a fighter pilot smarter than the average person? Obviously, to even be able to do all the technical, um, you know, knowledge you need to become a fighter pilot, you have to be pretty smart. But the idea of them being smarter because of their reaction speed, how do you think that fast? How do you react that fast? And actually, that question you know, started unpacking in my head for a number of years. And it was actually another story, if we go to the next slide, which actually gave some of the thinking and research behind it. So there's um, a table tennis champion in England who, uh, you know, you know, was one of the best table tennis players. Um, he had one of the fastest reaction speeds in table tennis. So if you think about table tennis being, you know, a really fast game already, and he had one of the fastest reaction speeds in table tennis, the idea was the press had sort of caught on to this idea that he had the fastest reaction speeds of any uh, sports person. And um, he found himself um, being asked to be part of a, a, an ad campaign where he was going to be facing off against the, one of the top tennis players, not table tennis, tennis players. 
and who had a really fast serve. So the idea was like um, he would be, you know, able to at least be able to return the serve, even if he couldn't play tennis well because of his fast reaction speeds. And he talks about this in, in, in a book he wrote. And he stood there on the court and he's waiting and he's a little nervous. He hasn't played tennis, you know, much anyway. But he was like, you know, look, I'm fast. I know I'll be able to get to the ball, but even if I don't get it over the net, the first ball comes at him and whizzes past his head. And he does, he hasn't even moved. Second ball, third ball, and suddenly, like the day's going on and on, and more and more balls are going past him, and he can't, like, he doesn't even know what to do. And he's like, What is going on? I'm supposed to have really fast reaction speeds. You know, how can I not even know uh, to be able to move in time to be able to, you know, at least get a racket to it, right? And that led him down a path which went back and he studied neuroscience at Cambridge University. And some of his research, which he talked about in his book, really explained what was going on. And it actually explains the, the fighter pilot as well. So the idea is, you know, from a ball leaving, you know, the tennis racket, and by the time it gets you, you do not have enough time to be able to react. So actually, there's been a lot of research on baseball, same sort of principle. By the time the pitcher has thrown the ball, there isn't enough time for the batter to respond to it. So the batter has to actually respond. The ta ta table tennis player, the tennis player has to respond before the ball uh, uh, even leaves the racket or the hand. How does that happen? So basically what your brain does, you know, if you've trained enough hours and become really good at a particular area of sport, is your brain's interpreting from the body movements, the cues that it has, where the ball's going to go. It's uh, able to predict where the ball's going to go just by how somebody's moving. So this table tennis champion is not really the fastest speed in all sports. He's really fast at being able to process how somebody like a table tennis player moves to be able to hit the ball, and he can react fast enough to be able to get it back. Yes, he has great reaction speeds, but the idea that he had the best in the whole all sporting world is the wrong neuroscience. So this idea that a fighter pilot is thinking faster than anybody else. What his brain is actually doing is being able to just pay attention to the right cues and be able to anticipate what's going to happen ahead of time and be able to respond in time. So this idea of what our brains does when it comes to these mental skills is be able to anticipate the future so we can respond uh, in the right time frames that we have. That's what's happening a lot of times in these really complex, you know, uh, mental processing, which happens for uh, elite athletes or even, um, you know, fighter pilots. If we go to the next story, I'll start tying some of these things together. The next story, we're back to chess. This is a fascinating, I actually was doing, you know, because I was doing research on chess and chess mover analysis using neural networks did a lot of research into chess and um, like all the different kinds of studies. And one of the interesting studies was uh, with grandmasters, chess grandmasters, some of the best chess players in the world, and people who are, you know, off the street, like people who might have played chess, you know, aren't sort of, uh, you know, masters at all, but sort of, you know, might sort of play sort of for fun. And in this study, what they did was they created chess, recreated chess uh, uh, pieces on a board based on a game. And you had a number of sort of, I think you had a couple of minutes to memorize the board. And then they wiped the board clean and you had to try and recreate from memory where all the pieces went. And it wasn't a surprise to anybody that the grandmasters could, you know, remember where all the pieces went so much better, like off the charts better than somebody who doesn't really play chess. And this was uh, and the initial reaction was chess grandmasters have this amazing memory. And what they did was in step two of this exercise, they really sort of broke this down, which was then they created boards which were totally random. So they weren't based on games. It was just somebody random. It's like a three-year-old started moving pieces or putting pieces all over the map. When the randomized pieces are on the board, this time grandmasters did no better than the you know the person who doesn't play chess at all. There's nothing to do with memory per se. It was the fact that a grandmaster uh, can look at a board and remember things at a higher level of what they call chunking. 
So they're not looking at every single piece and how it moves or where it is on the board. They can see a high level pattern and that high level pattern is what they're paying attention to. And that's how they are allowed to think and be able to play at a much more complex level than somebody who's just learning or somebody who doesn't know the game at all. So they can remember patterns of the board because the brain is chunked it up into these high level patterns. If we look at any expert in any domain, that's what they're doing. You know, we're all experts when it comes to reading. It isn't like we have to pay attention to every single letter in every single word or every single word in every sentence. We can read without even paying attention to it because our brain works at a higher level of what they call abstraction. Same sort of principle with chess. You know, a chess grandmaster has seen so many games, played so many games, they play at this higher level of abstraction. They chunk information up so they can play at this sort of higher level. Let's go to the next story. Um, this is the one before the last, but uh, Henri Poincaré is a uh, French mathematician from not only the last century, the century before. So he was not only an amazing mathematician, uh, he was one of the most creative mathematicians out there. He was actually one of the most creative people out there because math is actually hugely creative. Uh, but he, he was very self uh, sort of reflective. And he'd been thinking a lot about some of the biggest breakthroughs he'd had. Um, the, um, and, you know, some of the biggest breakthroughs he'd had uh, throughout his career. And he could actually walk, sort of unpack what he was doing. So he talks about this story. Uh, he doesn't drink coffee very often, which is, you know, a, a huge anomaly for mathematicians or physicists. You know, I heard the joke the other day. It's like, you know. Uh, a physicist is just a mechanism of turning coffee into diagrams. Um, and I've, I feel the same with mathematicians and computer scientists at some level. But he he drunk coffee and he couldn't sleep, and he had all these dreams of these ideas, but you know, bubbling around in his head. And he had to get up and you know he started working on this problem, and he made a big breakthrough uh, in this uh, area called fusion functions. And um, unfortunately. It was very close to him having to take a break. He had to go on this three-month excursion as part of a, another part of his job. It's kind of like these long vacations, and you know he was um, he was going to be away from his mathematics for a long time, so he couldn't work on this big breakthrough. Um, he talks about like he was getting on the bus. This is you know a month or so later. He's in the middle of this geology field trip, and he's getting on the bus, and suddenly the idea comes to him. As he says, out of the blue, the answer comes to him. His brain has solved this big problem, which he was sort of just starting to crack uh, right when he left. He had to wait until he got back to his hotel because he was very polite in the middle of the conversation. And he kind of starts working it out. And he realizes the big breakthrough is one of the biggest breakthroughs in this idea of fusion functions. This story is a perfect example of one of the best detailed examples of this idea of incubation. This idea that your brain keeps working on something a long time after you have consciously stopped thinking about it. This idea of incubation is the, there's a lot more research recently of how this plays out and um, you know um, how our brains do this and what are they actually doing. And incubation is this uh, element which is another glimpse into you know this learning mechanism and how do we create new ideas. And understanding how incubation works will actually help us unpack some of this. Let's go to the final story, and then I'll start pulling some of these threads together. So, you know, we could not have a conversation about intelligence and creativity uh, and learning without talking about Einstein. Einstein, uh, one of the you know preeminent physicists. Uh, he was a pattern clock, uh, but the work that he did changed the face of physics. And it was actually in his uh, uh, Annus Mirabilis year of 1905, where he made three breakthroughs, uh, each of which were earth shattering in itself, of which, you know, the, the, the fourth one, which is, you know, the idea of relativity was actually just one of these four ideas. And each one of these changed the, changed the face of physics. And they were all just problems he'd been working on for a number of years. But the piece which I'm most interested in is Einstein was contacted by a guy called Jacques Hadman. So Jacques Hadman um, is a mathematician, and he started collecting up um, research on how the top physicists and mathematicians solved problems. 
he's actually one of the people who talked and wrote about uh, Henri Poincaré, this idea of incubation and the story of the fusion functions. Uh, he'd sent out these surveys to all these mathematicians and uh, they filled them out and he started analyzing them to see sort of patterns. And some of the process of creativity and invention is actually comes out of Jacques Hadman's book. But one of the fascinating things was Einstein, you know, true to form, refused to answer the survey. And he actually, um, he actually wrote a letter back. And the letter is actually printed at the, in the appendices of the book, uh, which Jacques Hadman wrote. And in the, uh, in the letter, Einstein talks about his process. He talks about uh, how he comes up with ideas. And he has this concept of what uh, he called commentary play, which was similar to um, Poincaré's, like, you know, when he was dreaming on coffee, all these ideas are bouncing around. Einstein had that as part of his process. Like, he'd go into these sort of, you know, sort of these thinking sort of states where he would let his brain just sort of play with ideas. And these ideas would float around and they'd be like little hooks and then they'll combine together. And those combinations is what creates some of his best ideas. So this idea of combinatory play was one of the key things which Einstein said was critical to how he came and you know, solved some of the biggest you know, physics problems that in the world has seen so far. So these stories, you know, from the fighter pilot, you know, AlphaGo, uh, the chess grandmasters, the ping pong player, the table tennis player, um, you know, Poincaré and Einstein, these stories, as they all came out, you know, a different point of my research, I started bringing them together because they gave the clues to what I believe is, um, you know, the, the how to think and learn and this idea of mental models. So if we go to the next slide, we can start bringing this together. So you don't need to be an expert on AI, but what I, would, what I wanted to share is this framework of what I call narrow, this idea of narrow intelligence or narrow AI as it's described is basically a definition of the fighter pilot, the, the tennis, table tennis champion, the alpha go, they all have something in common. They've got, they are very focused and they're expert level, deep level in a very defined and narrow field. And they get really good. So whether you're a Sudoku champion, a Scrabble or chess or a fighter pilot, your brain has been trained with very specific cues to be able to play at the highest levels or do your task at the highest levels in a very narrow domain. You know, Lisa Dahl, you know, some people sort of said, you know, oh, he must be the smartest person in history because he's the smartest person at a game, um, which is the most complex game humans have ever created. But that's not true. He's really good at Alpha at Go, similar to Alpha Go. He's really good at Go, but it's not like if you put, you know, a crossword puzzle in front of him or a physics challenge, he could do it. Intelligence in this sort of domain is what we call narrow intelligence. This idea of narrow AI is what I translated back to how our brains work. And I started realizing that what we th think of as intelligence is one piece of it, which is this narrow intelligence. If we go to the next slide. So as I think about this idea of going deep and narrow, there's a number of different aspects which I want to talk about as I look back at this framework. Input, process, output. There are certain mental skills, and everything's a mental skill. Whether you're juggling, you know, riding a bicycle or playing tennis, they're all mental skills. You're reading, listening, speaking, you know, and some of these sort of techniques which we are going to talk about, question storming, are all mental skills. So when you're trying to learn a mental skill, you have to master and train at those skills to get better and better and better. And if you think about this overall as your input process output, you want to train on the skills across this. So this is where education is really important. This is where reading is a key part of the start of everyone's education, you know, and the ability to critically think and create and write. All of these aspects of a really good liberal education, these are the mental skills which we want to make sure we teach. But so is every other aspect as you think through this model. It's like, how can I get information in faster? 
So reading is only one of them. You've got listening, right? You've got podcasts now and audible, you know, watching, consuming information in different ways. You know, writing and outputting can be also different ways. So these mental skills, which are going to improve, and we'll talk about how they work together. But if you think about improving and training the right kinds of mental skills, these are things which are going to help you. So the next next piece of going deep is actually sort of the mechanisms which we talk about in diving deep into any subject. So how do you learn any subject you come across? So do we do this in a lab all the time? Hey, you have to learn capital markets. What's capital markets? I don't know. It's uh, you know the stock market. It's uh, you know where do wealth management fit and asset management and all of these topics. My, my team has to learn this really really fast. Like we have weeks, one or two weeks, and we can pretty much learn any complex topic. And this is sort of the framework which I use to teach them, which is there's a number of steps. The first step I, I get them to do is brain dump everything you know, even when you know nothing. So whether it's quantum you know, computing or it's capital markets, there are things that you are, know about the subject. There's always something. Get that all out of your head. So I get them to do a brain dump from memory, not looking anything up, just jot it all down. And I, I, and I say jot it down, whether it's electronic form or a physical form, writing it out, it has to be out of your head. You have to externalize it in some way. Then step two is actually, then you start writing down all the questions of the things you don't understand. And this is called the ignorance technique. And it's actually from um, a, fa a fascinating biography of Richard Feynman, who's another amazing physicist. He was um, one of the top physicists uh, in, during the Manhattan Project. Um, he helped with the space shuttle disaster, solving that. Uh, just a fascinating, fascinating guy in general. But this is after he's already got his PhD. He's about to start uh, postgraduate teaching. And the first thing he did was actually create, get a notebook and write down all the things he doesn't know about physics, everything he doesn't understand. And this is already, he's a graduate student, so he's got a PhD in it. He's obviously very knowledgeable. But he, what he started with this notebook, this uh, notebook of things I don't know about, is all the questions he still had. And this notebook which he kept on refining and iterating on for many, many years, turned into creating one of the top courses on physics, even to this day. The Feynman lectures, if you ever look them up, are some of the best physics lectures out there. Today, it was standing room only when he used to teach them. And um, the, it all started off with this notebook of being able to write down everything he didn't know at a level when he was already an expert. This idea of ignorance, I find is that step two, this question storming, like whether whatever topic it is, like start writing out what it is you don't know. And you'll revisit this over and over again. I do this with my kids who are homeschooled. You know, when they don't uh, understand something, like write out the questions, write out what you know, write out all the things you don't know, like articulate them as questions because it primes your brain to be able to um, be able to learn. So this goes to step three, we go to the next slide. Ignorance mapping. So this is like where you take the two different techniques which we've talked about, step one and step two. You know, you've mapped out everything you know, the known known, and you've mapped out everything you don't know, the known unknown. Now it's a case of mapping it, actually putting it on a diagram. So I do this all the time. So instead of just questions, I start mapping it. And it's not the beautiful diagram which my designer created here. It's normally a very messy mind map of some kind. But there's this idea of connecting ideas together. Because as you have with these questions, as well as the things you think you know, uh, you start connecting all those dots together. And it'll also reveal to you these huge areas where there's you know, what I call the unknown unknowns. These areas where you go, there has to be something here because this thing doesn't make sense at all. And they, those areas of unknown unknowns, the known unknowns and the known knowns, as you start mapping them out, this idea of an ignorance map is this great diagram which you can go back to over and over again as you're learning a topic. So these three steps are done over and over again as we, as we sort of learn any new topic. And these are things which you'll revisit as you learn as you build up your knowledge in an area, you'll start checking some of the boxes, some of those 
you know, known unknowns is going to, you know, be answered. Like, you'll know this now. Um, some of these unknown unknowns are going to turn into questions, you know, and those questions can be answered then. You're constantly refining. And some of those known knowns, those things you thought you know, might be wrong. And that's really an interesting part, which we'll talk about in debugging the brain. But this idea of going deep, this is a technique which we do all the time. So we go to the next slide. So this idea of exploring the unknown and what you sort of kind of seeing is a glimpse into this framework which I use, which is the known known uh, in the two by two grid. You know, uh, in the bottom, you know, left hand quadrant is the things that you know, the known knowns. Um, you know, move across to the right, you've got the known unknowns. These are the questions. If you go up, you go to the unknown unknowns. These are the things that you don't even know that you don't know. And you've got this really interesting quadrant, which I'll come back to, which is the unknown known. These are the things that you don't know that you know, and how relevant they are sometimes. And this brings up like um, a really interesting concept and an idea uh, which I've been playing around with for a long time. So. Um, Umberto Eco, made very famous by his book, uh, Name of the Rose, and the movie which is created, uh, semi you know, um, studies sort of the meaning of things, um, is, uh, is a really well-read individual. You know, he's, got, you know, he's read so many books. He's got about 30,000 books. Nassim Taleb, uh, who's uh, of the Black Swan, uh, he's famous uh, for writing a series of books, uh, Black Swan being the most famous, um, talks about Umberto, Umberto Eco and this concept of the anti-library. So he talks about you know um, how people used to visit uh, Umberto Eco's library of thirty thousand plus books and go, oh, Mr. Eco, you must be you know really smart because you've read all of these books. Um, and he, he would look at them and he'd kind of like go, I haven't read all the books. Uh, that's the point of having my library. My library isn't sort of an ego appendage. It's an active part of my uh, extended mind. And that, I'm putting my language in there, but it's like he externalizes all of his questions. So if you think about all those questions, those things you don't know, you he starts collecting books. He thinks about the books. He looks at them. He scans them. And they're part of his anti-library. That anti-library is an active learning mechanism. And it could be physical, it could be digital. Mine's physical, you know, I, I'm nowhere near 30,000. I've got about 3,500 or so books and it's kind of growing, but it's like, I, I'm constantly have more books which I haven't read and they're part of my anti-library. It's not that I haven't looked at them at all to the point I researched them and I found the best books on a particular topic which answered the question and I scanned them and I looked at all the frameworks and I looked at the appendix and I looked at the sources and I made these like connections in my brain. So when I have a topic or a subject I have to learn, I can go around and grab like three, four, five books and be able to jump into a new subject. And this is how our anti-library works. So, this idea of the anti-library and the unknown known is a key piece of this. The other side is, is the Mark Twain quote, um, which is this idea of uh, the unknown known, this, this concept of it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's not your ignorance which gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And I love that quote so much because that is part of this debugging the brain which is so important, and we'll touch on that. So let's get into mental models. We've been halfway through this, and we haven't even touched on this idea of mental models. But mental models is how a lot of these pieces come together. So you might not know this gentleman, uh, Charles Thomas Munger, Charlie Munger to the one, people who know him well. He's actually more famous as the the part of a partnership of uh, Warren Buffett. He's Warren Buffett's uh, partner. And um, fascinating guy, just like Warren Buffett is, he is very well read. And uh, he, he, he is like, he is the broad to uh, Warren Buffett's very deep and narrow at some level. And he came up with this concept, what he called the, this lattice work of models, which he talked about. Um, and a lot of it at the time, was uh, to do with what we call cognitive biases. So back in the 90s, he'd been doing lots of research and it helped him. So his study of you know, human cognition and cognitive science and you know, cognitive biases you know, helped him as an investor. 
But it, the idea of mental models went so much further because it actually gave sort of this idea of his well-read, his broad reading is actually what gave him a better way of thinking and solving problems. So, you know, if the facts don't hang together on a lattice work of theory, this idea of a lattice work. So he took, you know, you've got to take all of your experience, both vicarious and direct, and make this into a lattice work, this idea of lattice work of models in your head. And over the years, it's sort of been refined and been called this idea of a mental model. Your brain creates these mental models. And what Munger was saying was, you need to not only create them, but you need to have and connect these ideas together. As you read more, as you learn more, you start piecing together more and more aspects of the world. And the more parts of the world that you understand and how they work, and they can be modeled in your brain, it'll allow you to think, understand, learn, and create so much better. And it's at the heart of this framework which we've been putting together. You go to the next slide. So you might have seen variations of this, but the idea of building mental models sits uh, 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 along this one sort of uh, set of ideas. So if you think about when you learn a new subject, which you don't know that much about, it's kind of at the facts level. Like, you know, there are just a bunch of leaves on the forest floor. Like, so, you know, sometimes if, you know, people are trying to learn things and they're not fully understanding. And I know teachers, you know, get very frustrated with uh, students who are just trying to learn just, you know, what are all the dates of uh, in history or what are, what is this information? What are all the key equations I need to learn? But if they're just facts, they're like leaves on the floor of the forest. If you can organize them, you start putting them together, you can start creating a tree. Now you've got a little bit of organization, you've hung them in these particular areas. If you can start then go to that next level and actually building our relationships, how things connect together and refine it, like improve that diagram, then it becomes knowledge. And knowledge to become the next step, which is wisdom, is you not only know all of these things and how they're connected, but you start understanding the system that it works in, how it works together. Your brain is constantly trying to anticipate and predict the future, and these models aren't static. It needs to be able to use this model to anticipate not only how uh, a table tennis player is gonna hit a ball at you, but also be able to anticipate how a company reacts or how somebody's going to react to something or how people are going to vote. Your brain's constantly creating models of the world and trying to use that to learn. So this idea of mental models is you're trying to get richer and richer models to be able to get to this thing where you can actually understand how the system works together. If we go to the next slide. So bring this to sort of how this fits, these idea of these mental skills and collecting and building these mental models is definitely sort of the key first step. You know, what I always say, go narrow and go deep. You know, train and learn the mental skills which are gonna help you. So why do we teach reading the first thing? Because reading is that input mechanism which allows you to take all that information in. Like, you know, for the near infinite amounts of information, we create more information in 60 seconds than we can consume in a lifetime, and it's only gonna get more so we are gonna have to keep reading for the rest of our lives or at least find ways of consuming information. So building those input mental skills is really important. Understanding, synthesizing, building these models is the next step. So question storming and some of these other sort of techniques to build those rich mental models is, is gonna help you. And as you have, as you learn more things, it's gonna help you understand uh, more knowledge. Like more knowledge begets more knowledge. And this ability to output is also a key mechanism because it's actually a, sort of a circular system. You know, as I input information, I think about it, I output it, even speaking and teaching, you basically help your brain understand and make connections. So this going narrow and going deep, training these mental skills is definitely that sort of first dimension, which I always ask my students and uh, uh, new hires to learn. Go to the next slide. Now we're going to go to the next step, which is what I go, what I call go broad. So you've gone deep, you know how to build these sort of mental skills, uh, and gone narrow and deep in particular topics. You're hopefully starting to river jump and learn more and more subjects, and it should start helping you learn more things. But the idea of going broad is where everything gets really like to a more advanced level. And there's a reason that we have a flying dragon, and I'll talk about that in a second. But to go broad, 
you have to start really unpacking the things that you don't know. So we go to the next slide. So in this sort of input process output, in this idea of going broad, you need to start learning different skills, exploring and curating. You know, I used to say, you know, back in the 90s, as somebody who reads a lot, I used to spend whole days in bookstores trying to find all the different books, curating them. Obviously, Amazon came along, helped me start doing this. I can do this much faster. But I still spend a significant amount of time exploring and curating my anti-library, the books I want to read. And that's part of my input mechanism. It also it keeps me fresh on all the new things which are happening, especially around topics I'm interested in. This dragon questing, unpacking mental models is the process we're going to dive deep into. And this will help you build this like library, this lattice work of mental models as outputs, uh, which you're going to go. So this is part of what we call you know, going broad. Hunt dragons, unpack models. And this is the heart of this mental models framework. Go to the next slide. So TikTok videos, you know, like all social media, gets people in trouble. There was this uh, lo lovely teenage girl uh, who was doing a TikTok video, and, <laughs> and she was like pontificating about big subjects, which was uh, unusual for her. And she was putting on the makeup, and she said, I was just doing my makeup for work, and I just wanted to tell you guys about how I don't think math is real. So, you know, nothing big, but it set off a little social media firestorm. Like she became the poster child for what everything's wrong with this young generation. Like this idea, she doesn't even understand math. Oh my word! It's like you know, forget STEM. Like we, like how are people going to understand this if you know our teenage our teenagers of today don't understand one of the most important aspects of it? A scientist actually came to her rescue, and I love the way she did. And she basically said, "What she's saying." And I, I suggest you go and Google this and uh, find this TikTok video and actually watch it. But you know what she's actually saying is actually true. To the point she said, we teach you know mathematicians when they come into university, we have to reteach them to think about math in a whole different way. It's not about equations and additions and subtractions. It's actually understanding you know whether math is real. Like, is this this is actually a really deep question. It's something which I've spent a lot of time thinking about and actually going deeper and deeper in the last uh, sort of few years is this idea of like, you know, number theory. Like, do numbers exist outside of people? Is it something we created or is it something which actually exists? Like, do, does God play dice? Does God, uh, is God in the numbers which sit in the universe? Are, are we even seeing the right number system? Um, like, is our, you know, Hindu number system you know, zero to nine, does that actually capture the essence of all things in mathematics? So that question of is math real is actually a really big question. It's actually what I call, what am I, dragon or big question hunting sort of questions. Like these questions, these big questions, I collect. And this this is actually culled from my notebooks, all my notebooks over the years, some of the my favorite questions. Like how and why did we invent a mathematics? Obviously, like reading the history and really understanding it helped me understand math. You know, how, you know, how do statistical models work? What are they modeling? Like to understand life, understand, you know, where does the Gaussian curve come from? Where does the normal curve? You know, the history of shopping. I asked questions like, you know, I was fascinated by Jeff Bezos and how did he identify books and the internet as something which was going to be so big? What was it he saw back in the early 90s, which other people didn't see? I've spent a lot of time. I spent three years looking at what is money and helped us understand capital markets better. You know, how does Silicon Valley work? These are all these, these questions which seem simple on the surface, but they like can go really deep and they unpack more and more. And as somebody who's trying to learn for themselves, you know, not knowing what you don't know, you have to use these questions to curate your own learning journeys. And these big questions are normally the clues, these things you don't understand. And we all have them. Nobody knows everything. And constantly keeping track of these big questions, because those questions are going to be the things you can go and explore. Go to the next slide. So this idea of getting smarter and reading books, right? You know, it's more than that. But, you know, for many, many years, I thought every book I read made me, you know, X percent 
you know, more knowledgeable, right? You know, every time I read something, I was building my knowledge and over like getting to a point and it's this linear curve and I'm getting, you know, exponentially smarter and I'm learning more and more things. But I was wrong. Yes, you are learning, but you start reaching certain points where you're reading topics about things you already believe. And we'll cover that more in detail. You also, this idea, it isn't a linear equation. Also, the things you choose to read are impacting you know, how each book is actually helping you grow. So understanding what you read, not just reading more and more and more, is actually the key to getting smarter. Can we go to the next slide? So let's, let's unpack this uh, a, a little bit of this idea of you know, knowledge and what do you think you understand about something? So this is actually an, a, an experiment which we do in practical labs, but since we're, we can't do it practically, I'm gonna ask you to think about this and please, 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 please do try this at home. Is it, can you draw a working bicycle? So this is a question which was done in some experiments and they'll ask a group of people, um, now, how many of you know how a bicycle works? And these are like normally Harvard students, I think it was done at, and everybody put their hands up, right? And then they go, oh, cool, all right, here's a piece of paper in front of you. You know, without looking anything up, draw a working bicycle. And suddenly all these people who were supremely confident they understood how a bicycle worked, suddenly were faced with this realization, like they knew all the main elements, like there's wheels, got that, handlebars, got that, there's pedals, there's a chain, um, and then how they actually put it together. And if you've tried this or if you have never done this before, like I, I, I'd really recommend you try it because it's a struggle. We think we know how something works. Like whether it's electricity or something else, you go, hey, I understand how that works. Yeah. But then when you're forced to actually unpack it and actually draw it, you start realizing you know, what's missing. This is actually four variations, four very common variations to the point there's, I think there's a German um, inventor who built the four classic bicycles, which are the mistakes people make when trying to design this bicycle experiment. And there's four things like, you know, where the chain actually goes between both wheels, you know, and, you know, where, how does the frame fit? You know, can you actually move the handlebars? Because if, if, the, if it's connected to the frame, is the pedals on the front wheel? Like a lot of these things, you know, you look at them and you go, that's not right. But this idea of trying to get something and draw it to make it work is actually an example of the fact that we think we understand a lot more about the world than we do. Our brain black boxes things which we understand so we don't have to keep thinking about them. If I had to keep thinking about how electricity works every time I had to turn on a light, I wouldn't get very far. To the point, it's like if we had to think about every single thing, how it worked, we probably wouldn't have evolved and survived this long. We probably would have got eaten by the first saber-toothed tiger, which uh, rustled in the, in the grass. The idea of being able to black box so you don't have to think about everything is also a huge disadvantage as you learn because it's that area of, you know, the things that you don't know are the things which aren't getting in your way. It's actually the things you think for sure. And this idea of a black box and unpacking it. So this idea of a bicycle, you know, there's a lot of pieces of information we think we understand. So we have a black box understanding of it. Like I flip the switch, the light goes on. Yeah, I kind of understand electricity. Electrons flow, it goes to the light bulb, something like that, right? But when I'm asked to actually uh, unpack it and explain it, suddenly I have to open it up and understand, like, do I actually understand what happens underneath it? And what happens is the things that you know really, really well, like if you're a mathematician, you know mathematics really well, are sat right next to that thing where you read the, you know, the People magazine article while working, waiting at the dentist about some subject and that topic you feel you, know, you understand just as well as that, uh, you know, the years you spent in mathematics. But it's only when you open the box up and you look at it and you start realizing that you don't have much information or you have lots of information. If you have lots of information, you might have other boxes, what I call gray boxes, and you might have to unpack those boxes to be able to go deeper. If you've ever had to explain your educators, your teachers, you do this every day, but you know, to the rest of us, you know, if you've ever had to explain to a child how something works, you know, why is the sky blue? Suddenly you'll find yourself talking physics to a four-year-old and that's a, a hugely uncomfortable uh, area for many of us. 
but it's like it's that area where you're unpacking and they're going why 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 and you're slowly having to unpack every single piece of it at some point you kind of give up but that process is what you should be doing as you unpack mental models to really understand how deeply do you understand something and to the point if you can take it all the way down to first principles that's what you're trying when you really understand you know, when you understand something at that sort of wisdom level is when you've taken and understand something at the first principles. Go to the next slide. So this black box, gray box, white box, and unpacking them, you know, we're gonna be sharing these slides with you so you don't have to read everything here, but this is just an example from, um, <laughs> this is asset management, this was done for consultants, unfortunately, but it's the same sort of principle for any topic you know, how deeply do you actually understand something uh, enough to just use it? Or do you actually understand the topics underneath it all the way to, do you understand the first principles behind this? Go to the next slide. So here's some of the different mental models we teach. And I'm gonna fly through some of these because we, this is obviously meant for, you know, how we teach uh, people in our labs. So understanding um, how mental models work and what your brain does. I've already touched on this idea. Your brain is evolved to actually anticipate the future, predict the future. It's constantly trying to work out how is that table tennis player moving so I can anticipate where the ball's going to be. That's actually a glimpse into how our brains work. Our memories aren't there to remember the past. They're actually there to bring enough information so we can anticipate something which is going to happen. And we try to create mental models about everything. So in the lab, as business consultants, you know, what the key areas which you know, I'm trying to get people to understand is I need to understand you know, how the economy works, how companies compete, how companies work how society works, how people work together, how people work you know, at an individual level. These are all different things which are really important to a lot of the work which we do in the lab. And for each person, each domain, each subject, there might be a different set of things. But at, at some level, it's like for all of us, you know, how politics works, how society works, how people work, these are all things which are really important for us as human beings as social creatures. Go to the next slide. So, you know, this is what I call the meta mental model. It's something which I've been using, not as pretty as this version, but I've sketched it out over years. As I start trying to understand more and more subjects, like this helps me flesh out, you know, what areas don't I know yet, right? So I did a lot of sciences at school, then I, I've read more history and geography and aspects like that, paleoanthropology, geology, deep history, evolution. I did that all after I left school, you know, neuroscience, even understanding subatomic physics all the way to astrophysics. I studied all of that after I left school, you know, and all of these things like economics, psychology, literature, all of these things are just what I call meta mental models. If you can put it on a framework to understand how knowledge itself hangs together, it helps you. So the same as those ignorance maps or conceptual maps, I kind of use a meta mental model of all the topics which I need to understand better to be able to you know, do my job better. And obviously my job is very broad and I need to be able to understand so many different things. But you know, for each of us individually, we can probably create a you know, meta mental model of all the topics we need to understand. You know, this was unpacking and showing mathematics. Uh, it was to a number of data scientists. And so, you know, you could take mathematics and unpack it to all the different elements, right? You know, how functions, geometry and algebra and, you know, being able to go down to how calculus works and how it fits and interconnects. This is a perfect example of sort of a conceptual map for mathematics. Go to the next slide. This is actually a set of questions around how the economy works. So I've looked at the economy multiple different times and um, you know, I have these questions like uh, most recently uh, having to think through how the government's gonna respond to COVID. You know, we started unpacking a lot of this stuff like, you know, oh, I, I, I keep wanting to understand quantitative easing, you know, how the money supply works, you know, how does the Fed print money? And all the time I'm trying to flesh out my deeper mental model how the economy works. If we go to the next slide, you actually see a very pretty version of uh, something which sits in my notebooks, which is a much uglier version of this. But to really understand, what I realized when COVID happened was I need to understand you know, how the Fed prints money and how the 
the, the federal government uh, is going to work with Wall Street to be able to help Main Street and how all of these different elements of the monetary system actually work. How does economics work? And I've been fleshing out this model over and over again for the last 15 years as different points of different projects I've worked on because there's a different piece of the economy I have to understand. And I'm not an economist, but I've had to learn enough so I can help understand some of these trends which are happening. So this idea of going broad, building out your mental model library, you know, isn't really a linear process, but it is about growing your associative network. This knowledge, these mental models, this lattice work of information, as you start learning more and more and more, it, it helps you be able to add more things to it. So the more you know, the easier it is to learn more. Go to the next slide. So this is where we come to true wisdom versus genius, and I'll join some of the dots in the last few minutes of this talk, is this idea of, you know, especially in uh, sort of the sciences, computer science, mathematics, physics, this idea was unless you, you know, come up with your breakthrough theory by the time you were like 25, you know, you were never going to be able to do anything, right? You know, by the time you're 30, you're past it, right? Genius is only going to get shown as a, as a young person. And some of the biggest breakthroughs, whether it's Einstein, whether it's, uh, you know, Henri Poincaré, all of this, are some of the biggest breakthroughs they had were when they were young. But there's this other element of wisdom, which we don't pay enough attention to, because it is the young people who come out with fresh eyes who do make and change uh, domains. But there's also another group who come at it when they, the best ideas come much later in life. Darwin's a perfect example. Like he didn't come up uh, eventually until uh, the you know, theory of evolution until like 40 years, you know, after he'd been on the Beagle, right? These were long, long-term research projects he did. There's a lot of wisdom which comes in there. Understanding the difference between genius which is actually narrow intelligence and wisdom, which is more that broad, gives you a better way to think about, you know, this idea of young Turks and old masters. Go to the next slide. So this idea of, you know, you're growing your associative network and you're trying to actually be able to come up with new ideas by going broader is this idea of thinking and incubating. So how does your brain incubate? What is your brain doing? So if you think about Henri Poincaré, you know, he'd been thinking about this problem, he'd got it so far, and then he went on a geology trip, his brain was still working on something. He was doing something unconsciously. And it was that open problem. Our brain doesn't like open questions. So whether it's, you know, a, a really good page turning book, which is driven by, you know, all these open questions, who's the murderer? What's going to happen next? Are they going to survive? You know, these questions are done into a book to keep us engaged. It's actually part of something we find very motivating because we do not like open questions. So these questions sit in your head and they, you keep, your brain keeps trying to solve them and they keep thinking about them. What is it doing in that thinking in, in doing this incubation? is actually using that associative network. So think about all those different subjects you've learned over years, and your brain can start accessing that mental library and trying to find connections where you might not be actively thinking about them directly. So this idea of thinking and incubating, this commentary play, playing around with connecting ideas together, there's uh, Einstein, and then incubation, this idea of think cube. I actually created a product uh, for creativity based on power and commentary play and incubation, which called think cube. Thinking, incubating, think incubate, think cube uh, was something. And it came with a library of ideas and commentary play as a game mechanism. Um, but this idea of going broad, that's what you're doing. You're feeding your brain this larger latticework of mental models. Then you're using it to combine different ideas, both consciously which is what Einstein's doing, and then unconsciously, which is incubation, what Poincaré was doing. Go to the next slide. So this idea, and the last thing I'm going to touch on is, we've touched on it a few times, is debug the brain. Because the challenge which I said about reading more and more books is, if you keep reading only books you agree with or things you already believe, you'll suddenly reach a plateau where you will not actually go forward because you're only reading books you agree with. So I always say, you know, to stop you falling into these cul-de-sacs is challenge yourself. Read books which you disagree with. Find people who have different viewpoints. Smart 
people you trust who might believe things which are opposite to you, you know, talk to them, embrace them, think with them, and uh, really start bringing this together. And that's kind of like part of this sort of idea of debugging the brain. So if we go to the last few slides, I can kind of pull this together. So there's a number of bias cards which we talk about, you know, the Mark Twain quote is to really challenge yourself to be able to, you know, um, the things that you think you know, unpack the mental models, check your biases, you know, sample size of ones, you know, don't jump to conclusions, don't just go what we call hammer time. And this will help you unpack this sort of this top quadrant, which we call the unknown known. You know, read disagreeable books, break your beliefs, challenge your beliefs. It's hugely hard. And you know, it takes a lot of energy to read books you don't agree with, but it's important to keep doing it. I try and do it every sort of 50 books. I want to read a couple of books which challenge my beliefs because that's what some of the biggest breakthroughs that I've had. Go to the next slide. So Einstein Lung is a concept around when you get stuck on a puzzle. There's a classic nine dot puzzle, which you know is part of our other training course, and people get stuck. So there's this um, nine dots in a grid, and you have to try and find some way of connecting them with four straight lines without lifting a pencil. And most people try and do it, and they don't realize they put themselves in a box, and they think the it, the pencil has to be within those uh, that artificial box which is there. You have to actually draw the lines past the edges of the dots to be able to actually solve this problem. And this can be an Einstein lung in the sense like the false beliefs, the false ideas is stopping people. And we see this with kids, you know, you know, as my kids are learning things, it's the things that they think they know, which is stopping them from understanding some other things, especially when it comes to things like math. Go to the next slide. So bring this all together, compounding intelligence is this input process output, you know, build your mental skills, you know, improve and grow your associative network. There's mental models. There's things like working memory. So doing things like puzzles and games. And there's this great uh, sort of uh, game and a lot of research done around certain kinds of brain games, which actually improve working memory, but also debugging the brain. If you can bring these together uh, and think about, you know, you know, improving your input mechanism, improving your process and your output, you can not only increase your knowledge, but you can compound it. And that's what I'm trying to do and trying to teach to a lot of my students. So coming back to the greatest of all time, let's take these folks and actually map them. Uh, this is my interpretation. If we go to the next slide, we actually map them to how I'm thinking about this idea. So you've got a number of folks from Terence Tao, Lisa Doll, Judith Polgo, which are experts in deep and narrow. And as you start going broad, you've got people like, you know, Mary Curie and Richard Feynman and Maya Angelou and Bill Gates and Albert Einstein. This idea of intelligence being a one size fits all is very different. So whether you want to be a deep expert in a particular domain or you want to go broad and become more that sort of wisdom and be able to solve more complex problems. There's so many different kinds of intelligence. And uh, the direction you go uh, can be, you know, choose your own adventure. Thank you. This is, you know, uh, obviously a lot of information. Uh, hopefully you'll think about it. Please feel free to reach out to Mark and myself. But uh, hopefully you, you took something away from mental models and compounding intelligence. I think you're on mute, Mark. I can't hear you. Yeah, that's that's the mute button. <laughs> uh, I'm still building my mental model for uh, how how this this works. Um, Kez, I can't thank you enough for the time you spent with the uh, NAF Network today. I think uh, in the spirit of 2020, 2021, um, what better way to close out this year than to think about how some of the ways that we have had to move beyond uh, the parameters that have sort of defined the last century of education are gonna inspire us to sort of build new ways of doing things, new knowledge about our practice. So um, huge thank you. I feel like this was only uh, sort of the tip of the iceberg to a longer masterclass, but you and I are gonna talk more about how we can do some of that work together. Um, I can't thank you enough and I hope uh, that we can continue to engage you in these conversations. 
I would love to. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me. It's always fun to share this. NAF Network is definitely you know near and dear to my heart, and I, I want to help as much as I can. So thank Outstanding. You. Thanks, kids. Okay. Thank you.